Okay, so I'm just going to continue. Um, so, so we're moving into the month of Sivan, which is this month of the, of the, uh, of the twins, the connection, and and that's that's where we're moving into when we get to Mount Sinai and we receive the Torah. That month of connection, that month of Sivan, is um, where the where the where we're joining together, where there's a connection. And how amazing is that? That the zodiac signs line up. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's all part of the same idea that the that the energy in the universe is there to be tapped into. So the energy that happened when we came out of Egypt was the energy of the sheep of the following. We needed that energy. We needed to follow. We couldn't think for ourselves. We had to follow God into the desert. Then when we're in the desert, we're ER, we're bulls. We're like learning how to be independent. We're learning how to be strong. We're learning how to understand ourselves. And then when we get to Mount Sinai and we're going to join with Hashem and we're going to join with each other and there's going to be an Ish uh, Echad Belev Echad that we're going to be like one people, that's the energy of connection that comes in the month of Sivan, uh, as depicted by the twins. So the zodiac signs represent the muzzle, represent the energy that's in the universe that we're tapping into. So when we came out of Egypt, there's a redemptive energy that existed in the month of Nisan that exists in spring, which is why it's spring, which is why the buds are coming out of their, uh, out of their encasements. That's all happening because that's the energy that swirls around at that time. And when we come around to that time again, the following year, we have that energy again. And that's why Passover has to happen in the spring. Not that, um, not that, the, that Passover is in the spring and therefore we celebrate it in the spring. It's the other way around. Spring is the energy that brings about the redemption. Spring is the energy. The redemptive energy is there. And what, 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 the, what was able to be tapped into by, by the confluence of events was that's when the Jewish people had to be brought out because that's when the energy was, was most, um, most intense and most manifest, right? So that's when the redemption had to ha happen. Not, oh, it happened that Passover is in the spring, so it all has to do with the spring. It's spring energy, redemption energy is why Passover is in the spring in that season. And if you go back in the Torah, we understand that Abraham, do you remember the story of Abraham where he's sitting in his tent and the three angels come to, or the three men come and he takes care of them and he serves them matzah. We understand that he was, Abraham, says the Medrash, I think, uh, was uh, was celebrating Passover. Like, what is that about? Like we hadn't come out of Egypt. We, we had no... Um, you know, Exodus story it wasn't like, what did we talk? What are you talking about? Like Abraham's thousands of years before um, the Exodus story. What does it mean that he's celebrating Passover? It means that the energy of Passover was one that he could tap into. He had the spiritual antenna to be able to tap into that energy so that when Abraham is sitting in his tent and he's feeding these strangers that come to his home, he's feeding them matzah because he understood that that was the energy of that time. OK, so when we celebrate those holidays, we do ourselves a disservice if we only use them as ways to remember the past. If it's only about, oh, let's talk about what happened to the Jewish people when they came out of Egypt. That's half of it. The, the story and the historical memory of it and what we're supposed to teach our children, getting back to the whole idea of teaching our children, all of that is um, is important is very important, but the other piece of it is that that energy, we have to be mindful that that energy is there for us now. Like, how do I make this energy meaningful for me now today? How do I use it to change me, to project me forward, to make me into a human being, doing, moving, growing, right? We are not angels. Angels apparently have you know, I'm just, I don't really know what this means, but they, they don't move. They have like, like a solid leg, which is why when we pray the silent prayer in the synagogue, we stand and we don't move and our legs are together because we want to be like an angel who's like only doing the will of God. But the point is that we have legs that move. We move. We're, we're people who are engaged in a process, in a birth, in creating ourselves. Angels are not. They're just there to do the messengers, to be the, to be whatever they, we'll talk about that, you know, they, they have their role is set for them and they do their role. That's what they do. So it's really interesting then to think about how that plays out for us. Like we have to take the energy of the moment and use it and harness it. And, 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 and it's there for us. God's saying it's here. Like, yes, you can remember the story, but the story, number one, yes, know where you came from. And that's important to know that you belong to these people who came out from Egypt and there's slavery in your background for sure. And know that in this time period that you're sitting at your Seder table, that you're acknowledging that what's happening in the universe, that you can tap into that too. It's here again now. 
right? So when we get to the holiday of Shavuos, which is coming up in a, a little bit, a little bit after Memorial Day is when Shavuos is, it's 49, it's the 50th day after the second day of Passover, right? We're in that period now, we just learned that. Um, we will celebrate Shavuos, and Shavuos is an energy of accepting the Torah. It's an, it's an energy of um, kind of like like understanding and integrating and and kind of like a, a, um, re-accepting and re-committing ourselves to Torah truths, to, to the wisdom of the universe. Like, yes, I want to know it. I want to learn it. I want to be part of it. I want to connect myself to it. And, and God's giving it to us. And there's a greater energy of it coming and that we can accept that, of, of, of accepting it and, and taking it in and being open to it and being open-hearted to it and being one people and all of that. That's what's happening in Shavuos. So I want to, I want to fast forward to the holiday of Sukkot that we were talking about earlier and this idea that Sukkot, where we go out into our little booths that we, our little houses or little whatever we, constructions that we make outside, some of us do that, we go outside of our houses and we sit in them and we said that it, it represents the clouds of glory that encompassed the Jewish people as they were traveling through the desert. Um, and, and what is it? It's a protection. It's God letting God lead us. He led us through the desert. We went wherever he told us to go and we, we recognized that God was protecting us and we were safe. We could then transition from the sheep to the bull to the twins to the connection we could work on that progression we could actualize ourselves you know Maslow's hierarchy um, Maslow's triangle of hierarchy right where you don't have to worry about the bottom layer which is your basic needs you know, like your shelter and your food like God's giving us food he's giving us shelter right so we're learning how to actualize ourselves learning how to get into like our soul talk we don't have to worry about the basics we're going up the triangle and I wonder whether here we are in COVID times, and Rabbi Sachs brings this out in his uh, Devar Torah this week about this Pasha Emor, where he talks about he talks about the energy, the energy of um, recognizing that God's taking care of us, <laughs> and yes, that's Sukkot energy, and yes, that's going outside of our house, but it's also an, an the day, the festival, the holiday where we are commanded, where we are. We are where where we are uh, given the opportunity to celebrate the holiday with joy. It's the man It's the holiday where we are asked to be joyous. Okay, when we talk about mandating um, emotions, but the holiday of Sukkot is the day where we where we the holiday is one of joy, and it's an interesting paradox because. We're out in the wild, we're out in our little bat huts, and we know, you know, sometimes there's squirrels and raccoons and who knows, and there's rain and there's the elements and there's a, and you're outside and you don't know what's going to happen. And there is a, an aspect of fragility, of, of recognizing the natural world around you, which we're all doing now, and also that God's protecting us, recognizing that God's protecting us. And in that space of, of sort of sitting back and saying, okay, God's in charge, which we do every Shabbat, God's in charge, there should come from that perhaps um, a, 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 um, an aspect of, <clears throat> an aspect of, um, of joy, an aspect of, I don't, I, I don't need to be anxious. I don't need to worry. I'm going to let go of being in charge, of being in control. And again, I think, you know, that some of these are the conversations that we're having in our COVID days is recognizing how little control we have and who we, who, who do, where do we go <laughs> to say like, who's in charge, you know? And as a believing, you know, person, I, I believe God's in charge and I, and he's, he's, God is deciding or God is, God has, um, the ultimate um, picture, the big picture, and understand why the world has to go through this and what it is that we're going to learn from this and how we're going to... But from our standpoint, I wonder if it doesn't um, re remind us of the Sukkot, the Sukkot days where we're sitting in our Sukkot saying, you, God, are in charge. We're letting go. And in that letting go, in being faithful, in, in trusting that God's in charge, there's a certain joy that comes from that and a certain like, I can now sleep, I can now rest, I don't have to take charge, I don't have, to... yes, we have to do everything we possibly can, I'm not saying that we just sit at home, well, we... I am saying that we all sit at home, um, but yes, we have to do the best we can and wash our hands and wear our gloves and 
put on face masks and not go to the store as much and like like hunker in there's something we have to do and then there's other things that we have to do um but the idea of letting go and letting god take 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 charge yes we put in our efforts and the rest is up to god and i think that's part of the message perhaps of the sukkah story or the sukkah idea or the sukkah energy is to understand that god's running the world and as much as i am fearful about what will happen let go you know say god's in charge you know just like he took us through the wilderness for 40 years and fed us and clothed us and did everything for us you know i i i don't know quite how that sits with everybody but i think that that's something to ponder and to think about like how much how much we worry about things worry about things that we can't change and uh, to let go of that there is a tradition on Shavuos to eat foods that are um, to eat foods that are dairy to eat milk foods and it's interesting given three different reasons I, I learned recently why we eat milk foods on the holiday of Shavuos so um, one is that uh, milk breast milk breast milk changes flavor depending on what the mother eats so if she eats different foods and the milk comes out different so that idea that the wisdom in the world the wisdom that comes out through Torah taste different depending on who we are and what we're thinking and what's happening in our lives and that, and what we read and what we learn that there's that there's different flavors of the Torah that come out so I thought that was a really nice um, analogy to think of milk um, Torah being like milk that it can taste different depending on you know where we're at and what we're what we're feeding ourselves with that the Torah that come that we that we ingest so to speak is going to taste different that's one the other is that milk apparently um, um, uh, is most what's the word I'm looking for? The most um, preserved. It 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 it, it is uh, it, it contained best in an earthenware vessel. In an earthenware vessel. So an earthenware vessel is like a, a humble. It's the lowest kind. It's not fancy metal or anything. It's like a. It's not gold or silver. It's like a. You know the earthenware. It's like the lowest. It's the it's the humble. It's the it's the down to down to basics. So again, the idea that when we become more like earthenware when we are the vessels then we're going to hold the milk and it's going to be fresher if we're like the earthenware vessel if we're like the matzah if we're like the lower like we're like more humble so that's another idea and then the third idea that i really like um is the idea that um is that milk when you have a milk meal you feel kind of sleepy like it's a soporific it kind of puts you to sleep <laughs> uh, so the idea isn't necessarily to go to sleep but the idea is that when you eat milk, that it makes you calm. That, it, that it, you know, we give milk to, you know, warm milk to children when they're all anxious, you know, calms you down. There's a certain something like, like an aspect of it that takes the stress level down. And perhaps that's another way to understand this idea that I just gave over about the sukkah and about the clouds of glory and about letting go and letting God take charge. And when we do that, that our anxiety level goes down. That milk kind of puts us to sleep. It kind of makes us feel like, okay, everything's okay with the world. Like, I don't have to run everything. I don't have to take care of everything. I don't have to worry about everything. Um, that I'm going to let God take over. I'm going to get let God take over. And that's a huge thing to think how we do that, how we let God take over. But that's, uh, that's one of those ideas is that, is that, that, that when we drink milk, we, we get into a calmer state of mind and that's the, 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 that's the mindset we want to have where we're calm. Do our work, do the best we can, the rest is up to God and kind of stay, take a step back and not get frantic and worry and, like, about things that are outside of our control. Okay, so let me just go over a couple of things. So this, this week's Torah portion, Emor, talks about the Kohen and how the Kohen, the priest, um, had to had to um, so Moses had to teach the Kohen and his children the sons of Aaron so we you know this idea of teaching everybody teaching the next generation keeping the Masora keeping the tradition going important to to do that and to do it with emor do it with a, a love language with 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 um, with embrace and with kindness and not with a harshness I and mean, like a, a directive but more more calm and kind and loving. Um, and then the idea of the co the Kohen and, and how his job is to connect heaven and earth, to do the work and to bring the sacrifices in the temple that bring heaven and earth together, blessing the people, bringing godliness down to the world, blessing the people, and that through his words he's blessing the people. And in order to do that, he has to hold himself separate. He has to be separate from, separate from, 
things that are disconnected. He has to be separate from death, which is a disconnection of the soul from the body, the soul, the heavenly aspect, the, the divine aspect from the physical body aspect. That death is a separation of those two, and the Kohen is about connecting the two. So he can't be around the tame, the void, the the the, en the spiritual energy that comes from death. He can't be around that because it's it's antithetical to his job of connecting the two. Same with divorced. He can't, cannot marry a divorced woman because the divorced woman has been in a relationship that has that has exploded, so to speak. And and in that relationship, there's a lack, a loss of the divine, the divine that was there gluing it together, not gluing it together. That was part of that relationship. That the divinity, that the divine aspects of of a, of a healthy, good, loving marriage had gone. And so in that, that's again a, a separation, a void, a, a, dis, a disconnect from something that's co about connection. So you can't marry. And, you can't, and again, this idea about being a, um, uh, that the Kohen is a, um, the Kohen cannot function as a Kohen if he has a blemish. He can't bring a sacrifice that's a blemish. And the whole idea of separation, how things are separate in our world, that we have separate things. We have night and day. We have we have the Kohen who's different from the rest of the Jewish people. We have the Jewish people that are separate and different than the rest of the world. We have holy days and we have Shabbat that are different than the weekdays. We have a lot of distinctions and differentiation, differentiations, boundaries that distinguish um, things from each other. So yes, about unity, but also diversity. And we want to be, you want to be one, but we also recognize that there's diversity in that oneness. Okay. And then we talked about the holidays. We talked about different holidays. Specifically, we talked about the energy that exists in a holiday, that a moedim, that these holidays are times for us to have a meeting with God, to rendezvous with God, so to speak. Um, the idea of seven days is six days of the week of the work week and then seven days a separate day it's a Shabbat and then going into the eighth day which is supernatural it takes us beyond the beyond the normal beyond the natural into the next realm which is why a baby boy had a breach we talked about this before on the eighth day we've gone through the six weeks six days of the week work days we've gone through that special Shabbat day which is nature and God combined. And now we go into the supernatural above nature onto the eighth day. And that's when the baby has his breed. And also when we count the Omer, we talked about counting these days between Passover and Shavuos. We're counting 49 days. It's seven times seven times seven times seven. We go seven, seven's 49. And then we go 50 into the 50, we go up into the eighth. We go into the supernatural, into Shavuos or accepting the Torah. We talk where we're, where we're able to accept the Torah, where we've changed, we've worked on ourselves, we've we've gone step by step, day day in, day out. We're working on ourselves, we're changing ourselves, we're moving um, towards a goal of birthing ourselves, of being the kinds of people that we want to be, and surrounding ourselves with the people that we want to surround, and focusing on different character traits that we have, and working on them, and trying to improve them, and always moving, always moving. Um, so we have all these all these festivals built in, built in as moedim, as days where we where we where we where we have a rendezvous with God, we have a date with God, and and an amazing it's amazing that's built into the universe. And to talk about time, how time is this um, ascending spiral? It's not circular. We don't come back and come back to the exact place we were before. We've hopefully gone up a notch. You know, yes, it's linear time, and we're going through time. But we're also going around, coming around to that same energy that exists at this time of year. And we talked about that vis-a-vis -vis Passover. Why Passover is a springtime holiday. It's spring. The energy that exists man, is, 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 is why Passover is in the spring. Because that energy is, exists there. It's an energy of breaking out. An energy of breaking. And same with Shavuos. And same with Rosh Hashanah. And same with Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a day of forgiveness. That's when the, that the greater concentration of forgiveness is, is available to be had. That's on Yom Kippur. It has to be on that day. It can't be on a different day. We can't celebrate Passover on the wrong day. It has to be on that day because that's the that's when you're hitting the acupuncture point. When that when when that energy of of Passover of redemption is most concentrated is on the first night of Passover. So yes, you can celebrate the Seder on another night, but you're not tapping into that energy that's there to be had. And we're enjoying. Don't just reminisce. Yes, reminisce, but also. Also harness that energy for you today and make it work for you today and use it like we're being given a gift. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is the end of this week's Torah portion. We learn about a man who is descent, who is the child of a woman who is an Israelite. She is from the tribe of Dan. 
we learn about this child who came from this woman and she and the father of this child is uh, an Egyptian and uh, if you remember back in our Exodus story of Moses when Moses comes out of Pharaoh's palace and he sees the Egyptian he sees the Egyptian beating the Israelite and he kills the Egyptian if you remember that and then the Jews say to him, you know, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? And he gets really worried and he runs away. That's the beginning of Moses going to Midian and meeting his, and the beginning of the whole burning bush and et cetera, et cetera. But that's what happens at the beginning. With the Israel, the Egyptian that Moses kills is this man's father. <laughs> All right. And, and because in those days, the way in which, and still today goes like the tribal, the tribal, um, 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 the tribal, the, the tribe that you belong to goes by the father, right? So the Kohen is this, is descended. Anybody who's a Kohen is goes through the father's line from Aaron, Aaron the high priest back in our Torah, right? Moses' brother is Aaron. And anybody who is descended from Aaron through the father is a Kohen. So when the Jewish people were encamped around the Mishkan, around the tabernacle, they were camped in tribes. They were camped in tribes, and each tribe was one of the sons of Jacob. So the woman, who is the mother of our blasphemer in our story, the mother is from the tribe of Dan. So the blasphemer is, uh, is upset because he doesn't have a Jewish father. He doesn't have a father that gives him a place to have a camp. He wants to pitch his tent. He wants to be part of the tribe where his mother lives, of the tribe of Dan. And they say, no, you can't come here. You don't belong here. You have to go by your father. But his father was an Egyptian. So he goes to um, a court. He goes to Moses and he says, what shall I do? And Moses says, you can't pitch in the tribe of Dan. You, you can't pitch there. You can't go there. And he's so angry. He's so angry that he blasphemes and he curses. And, and it's, this is the only, one of the only stories in the whole book of Leviticus is this story of what happens to this man. And the, and the uh, result of him doing this is that he's, um, he's, um, that he's given the death penalty for breaking down the social fabric. But I think there's a couple of things to think about vis-a-vis -vis this blasphemer. Number one, when we talked in the beginning about the Kohen, who is able to use his words to bless and use his words to bring positivity and, and beautiful things into the world, that's one way of using our language. And now we have the opposite. At the end of this week's Torah portion, we have this blasphemer who's using his words for the opposite. He's breaking it down, right? He's And, and, and he's angry. So he's using his anger and taking it out. And maybe he knows there's God. Maybe he doesn't know there's God. Maybe he's so angry at God he doesn't care. But he's saying things that that the that, 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 that the people can't um, the people can't be exposed to. It's it's too it's too it's too um, 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 offensive and wrong, right? And he shouldn't be doing that. And you gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta go. So. What's interesting about this, about this, uh, another idea of this is that he didn't accept the answer. He didn't accept that the answer was you can't live here amongst us. I'm not sure where he's supposed to go, but he didn't accept that the answer is that you can't be here. And it's really hard to get into that mindset of, of accepting. If you go back to the idea we talked about, about the Kohen who has a, uh, who has a blemish, he can't serve in the temple. The, bl the blemished, the Kohen with a blemish can't serve in the temple. Also, this descendant from the Egyptian man and Israelite woman doesn't have a place in the camp of Dan, but he doesn't accept it. So we have this idea of what we accept and what we don't accept. And I'm not, I'm not giving any, uh, giving any, um, you know, direction. I'm just pointing out that in this case where this particular man did what he did, the consequence of doing that is the death penalty. And he was like put outside the, you know, put outside the pale. He said, you can't live amongst us. Um, that, he, that his choice of whether to accept the decision that Moses' court gave him when he took it to court and his case was heard and the answer was, you can't pitch it here. He didn't accept that. And so he then lashed out and he and he did what he did. He didn't accept it. Whereas the, we, we don't hear about any Cohen who didn't accept that if I have a blemish, I can't serve in the temple. So I'm not quite sure how that plays into our lives today, but it's something to think about. And I think it's also something to think about, about the people who don't fit into our bell curve. We have a bell curve of like who's in and who's out. 
you know, like like there are people, it says in our Torah over and over and over and over again, it says to take care of the widow and take care of the orphan and take care of of the stranger in your midst, to take care of those people. Why? Do, and one of the reasons given as to why it says that over and over and over again is because those are the people on the outline. Those are the people that sort of don't kind of quote fit in. They're the people that we have to take care of because they're not part of the bell curve. The bell curve is in our society, I, and I think is, you know, the, the households with, you know, mom, dad and children. You know, but what about the the single people? What about the gay people? What about the people who who, who don't get married or the people who um, are widowed or the people who can't have children? Or like, there's a lot of out people that don't fit into that bell curve, and and it's up to us to really bring those people in and to make sure that they feel and not just that we're like we're taking care of them, but that they are part of us, that we're part of them, that we're all part of a whole. That they shouldn't get to the point where they're going to turn around and and curse, or they're going to turn around and say, you know, like there's no God or whatever whatever the people will say. Like it's up to us to really to really kind of like take those people and hold them and love them. And that's what, that's important for us to do. So um, I know we're probably getting a little bit over and I, I'm sorry that this Shia is, is split into two pieces, but um, I want to go back over some of the things. And, and really the most thing, the thing I want to say is that we all have a place in this world. We all have a place in this world. And we all, <laughs> we all have a job to do to work on ourselves, to birth ourselves, to get to the place where we fit into the puzzle of life. So we fit in so that, that we don't, we're not separate. Yes, we're different. And yes, we have different um, parts of us and different um, energies and different um, um, gifts that God gives us to, to, to put that into the world. And, that we, and if we can build that up, that's a really good thing. So um, just to recap, the idea of the Kohen and the way he uses language, the way the blasphemer and he uses language, direct opposites. Um, the way in which we delineate the Kohen as being different from the rest of the Jewish people and the way that the the Kohen who's blemished is different than the Ko the rest of the Kohanim and we accept that, we accept that, you know, there's a joke, I'm going to end on a joke now, there's a joke about this uh, fellow who really wants to be a Kohen and he goes to the rabbi and he said, can you make me a Kohen and the Kohen says, no, I can't make you a Kohen, he says, I'll give you, you know, $10,000 and he keeps offering him more and more money. He says, I can't make you a Kohen, but I have a really interesting question for you. Like, why do you want to be a Kohen so much? And he says, I want to be a Kohen because my father was a Kohen and his father was a Kohen. So, you know, we understand that the Kohen goes through the father. So if your father is a Kohen and, he, you know, you continue to, in that line, you are the Kohen because your father's Kohen. You can't become a Kohen. Either you are or you're not. But if you are, then you have a special role to play. And that role means that you can't come into contact with the dead. It means that you can't marry a divorced woman and so on and so on. And we spoke about what that, one of the one of the Kabbalistic understandings of why that is, that the Kohen can't come close to death and he can't come close to a divorced woman. So go back and listen to the beginning of the year if you want to hear that, because I think it's really interesting. But um, anyway, so so that, that the Kohen is one who uses his language to love and to bring peace and to bring blessing into the world. And then we talked about the holidays and we talked about the ways in which the energy of the holiday um, is why the holiday is then. The energy of forgiveness is when Yom Kippur is because Yom Kippur has to happen on the day when there's most energy of forgiveness in the world. And if we, in our day, want to tap into it, we can't say, oh, it happened long ago, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with us because the way in which we live our lives and how we tap into it is a gift. Here's the energy of forgiveness. Tap into it because you can ride that wave. You can ride the wave of redemption from things that hold you back when you're in the month of Nisan. You can, you can be, you can be this, this energy of faithfulness in the moment of living outside in your sukkah. On, in the holiday of Sukkot, where we have faith that God's going to take care of us and going to lead us where we need to go. And I think that's a message for today too. Um, Rabbi Sachs says, faith is living with uncertainty. Faith is living with uncertainty. And aren't we in uncertain times now and how much faith we have to have to say, God's running this ship. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my bit. But at the end of the day, it's not up to me. Oof, and that we have this ascending spiral, the idea that we can create ourselves, the idea that we count the Omer, we go from the second day of Passover all the way to Shavuos, and we're eating, we, the, the Omer is this animal food that we're, that, we're, that we're offering, that we're getting rid of the animal side, we're channeling the animal side into a more spiritual side, working on ourselves, 
building ourselves up. And what do the holidays do? The holidays define us. They that Passover is this holiday where we know who we are as a people. We break out from things that hold us back. Shavuos, we're, we're learning the moral code, the lessons, we're accepting that. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, we understand the brevity of life and uh, and the ability to to know God is that uh, God is in, is is created the world, runs the world. Um, Yom Kippur is this forgiving, mending time, um, a, a time for us to um, to look at our faults and to and to try to work on those. Sukkot is this journey through life um, analogy of of living temporarily and living with joy in the fact that we are traversing the desert of life with God around us, sustaining us and and holding us and protecting us, and that we can have some level of joy in that and level of acceptance and level of uh, stress free and worry free. Um, experience the energy in the present. That's what the holidays, these these days, these moedim, these days where we have a rendezvous with God are telling us now is this inherent energy in time where we can experience that energy now. Let's manage time well. Let's recognize that time is a spiral and uh, that there are sacred moments uh, where we can acknowledge that energy and use it to change ourselves, to mend ourselves, to redefine ourselves, and um, to take ourselves to take ourselves along, to move ourselves along with joy. And uh, so, I wish you all a good week.